sorry I'm not Ibuke. Uh, yeah, continue. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry I'm not Ibuke. Um, but uh, so this this is kind of a last minute thing. She had to um, she couldn't present for personal reasons. Um, so uh, I'll try and approximate what I think she would have said, um, and I'll talk about a paper that uh, is forthcoming in a collection in Kit Fine. I'm glad to hear a lot of you were interested in truthmaker semantics and Kit Fine stuff because I think this topic kind of we wrote this paper mainly for people who are interested in these things. So um, there's going to be a limit to how long I can motivate truthmaker semantics and so on, but I'll do my best um, given the time we have. Um, okay, so. Um, so here's a question. This is the key question we're interested in. Does truth maker semantics improve on Hintikan semantics for epistemic logic? Um, and uh, as I trust everyone knows, Hintikan semantics is basically an approach to epistemic logic where you treat epistemic logic as normal modal logic and uh, you just take the box and uh, interpret it as a knowledge operator and that's what Hintikan semantics is. Um, as a lot of you probably know too, there are some well-known problems with the Hintikan semantics, um, chiefly the problem of logical omniscience, I guess. Um, so a lot of people feel dissatisfied with it and there's all sorts of attempts to do something different that deals with some of these problems. Um, and that's the spirit in which we're interested in this question as to how um, a truth maker semantics for epistemic logic compares to a Hintikan approach. Um, and uh, the answer to this question you'll see uh, that we give in this paper is that actually um, it's not a clear yes, no answer. I think it's more like, the answer is more like it's complicated. Uh, it's gonna turn out there are lots of different ways of developing epistemic logic in the truth maker setting. Um, more than we're gonna talk about, I'm just gonna discuss a few that uh, are kind of natural options in the sense that they use notions of implication and content that Fine himself talks about a lot in the case of truth maker semantics. So we just sort of import some of those ideas and reinterpret them into uh, thinking about epistemic logic and see what we just see what happens. And you end up with all sorts of options and, um, and they're not the same option. They, they end up with very different logics, um, all of which bear on some important uh, questions about whether the logic counts as good or bad, we'll see. So yeah, it turns out to be a very complicated situation and I feel like we're just scratching the surface. I should just mention, by the way, since maybe the title is a bit misleading, I'm not gonna say anything about what counts as a truth maker for a knowledge claim, uh, formally or substantively. Um, the spirit in which we're interested in truth maker semantics here is we're interested in its capacity to model bodies of knowledge and then use that as a way of uh, talking about what an agent knows or doesn't know and how different bodies of knowledge interact with each other. That's a better way of thinking about what we're doing as opposed to the search for truth makers for knowledge claims or something like that. That's an interesting question, which maybe uh, we should tackle in a follow-up paper. Anyway, just to give you a sense of why this is a complicated question, one reason this is a complicated question um, about you know, what's a good way of doing epistemic logic is for a start, uh, you need to answer questions like this, um, these sort of sub questions. The first question is this, uh, you know, what are you doing when you're designing the epistemic logic? What is your target in designing the logic? What, you know, what's the phenomenon that you're trying to capture? Uh, and it turns out that's a complicated question. There are different ways of interpreting what you're trying to do when you give an epistemic logic. And, but once you fix that, you can only then really start asking whether the Hintikan semantics succeeds or doesn't. And once you've decided what the target is, you can start asking yourself questions like, what are the limits of the Hintikan approach? And uh, can a truth maker approach do better? You can also ask questions like, what are the successes of the Hintikan approach? And uh, can a truth maker approach um, meet those, have those same successes without incurring too much complexity and so on, right? Um, so here's what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna start off by giving three different target analyses uh, for somebody who's giving an epistemic logic. So three different targets for what you're trying to achieve with this logic. Um, then what I'm gonna go through is some candidate principles for such a logic. So candidate principles, uh, candidate validities. Um, and um, the reason I'm gonna do that is because a popular and commonsensical way of trying to judge whether you've got a good logic in any circumstance is um, you know, to think about candidate principles, think about the principles that you want and think about the principles that you don't want relative to your target of analysis. So I'm gonna go through some important principles in the case of epistemic logic. 
And in particular, I'm gonna point at some principles that are uncontroversial. So those are important because um, I'll argue anyway that these are principles that you want your epistemic logic to deliver as validities. Um, and uh, I'll also mention some principles that are controversial. Okay, and, and as we'll see, some people have thought of the fact that um, say Hintekin semantics delivers these principles, they think that that's a reason not to like Hintekin semantics. So I'll say something about that. Um, then I'll talk about the Hintekin approach and basically the message there is gonna go through quickly, but the message there is gonna be that it validates all of the principles that I'm gonna mention, the controversial ones, the uncontroversial ones, you name it, okay? And some, again, some people see that as a problem. Then what I'm going to do is start developing some options for doing epistemic logic with a truthmaker framework. So I'll start off just by giving an exact truthmaker framework in the style of fine. And then the goal will be to uh, give some options for extending it um, as an epistemic logic. So introducing some knowledge operators. And I'll give you actually six different ways of doing that. And they're related to each other. So it's not quite as uh, random and convoluted as maybe it seems um, to say we're going to do six. Um, but yeah, it's going to be six different semantics for giving a conditional knowledge operator in this setting that will allow us to compare it to the Hintekin setting. And uh, we'll be able to say something about the logics that are generated. Um, nothing uh, too deep. Um, we're just going to look at the validities that are satisfied and not satisfied out of our candidate principles, as opposed to giving sound and complete um, systems or anything like that. Um, and then I'm going to end up giving you a preliminary ev evaluation once all that's on the table um, and point out some good things, as it were, that the truth maker semantics seems to be doing and point out some things that you might worry about. Okay, so that's the sense in which we're not going to have a very clear answer at the end of the day. Although I think it is also clear that in certain senses, we're definitely going to make some progress in the Hintekin approach. All right, so here's the language we're going to be working with. Um, so we're going to have some propositional formulas as usual, uh, you know, uh, propositional atoms, negations, conjunctions. Uh, more of more interest are these epistemic formulas we've got on this side. Uh, here's how to read these things. So a uh, formula that looks like this, a phi, read that as phi is knowable a priori. Okay, so uh, intuitively, what's an example of a phi that's knowable a priori? You know, just stuff like one plus one equals two, pick your favorite examples. But that's, that's the kind of target phenomenon here. This is the intuitive reading of a phi. Uh, not going to say too much about what a priority is. We want to be as neutral as possible about this, of course. Um, this uh, conditional, uh, phi arrow psi, the way to read that is that psi is an a priori implication of phi, all right? So the intuitive examples we have in mind there is sort of our informal in interpretation of these things is, uh, well, an example would be that John is unmarried is an a priori implication of John is a bachelor, okay? Um, so another way to read this is it is a priori that phi implicates psi. Um, we're perfectly happy with that way of putting it. We just don't want to say too much about what the implication there is exactly. And it turns out we don't need to get into that for what I'm going to say. So we're just going to sort of keep it all together and talk about a priori implication. Um, and then we're going to have a conditional knowledge operator. And that's a little bit different from um, most accounts of epistemic logic, which have unconditional knowledge operators. But I like working with conditional ones because they allow you to express many more principles of interest um, at least for the purposes of this talk. So uh, read this as, um, well, this is k phi psi. Read that as knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi. All right. Okay, so that, that's the language. That's the informal interpretation. Our goal is to come up with design logics that are gonna give us a formal semantics for interpreting these things in a formal way and generate logics thereby. And, uh, and then we wanna have some way of testing whether we've got um, sort of good logics as opposed to bad ones, right? Okay. Now, I said that k phi psi is to be read as knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi. And uh, I deliberately put that in a kind of a vague way because there are at least three different interpretations for what you might mean by that. And I wanna get them all on the table uh, because one of the things that's interesting about epistemic logic is that these are prominent interpretations and uh, depending which interpretation you're after, you're probably looking for a slightly different logic. So it's gonna be interesting to have them all on the table keep them in mind so that we can distinguish them from each other instead of confusing them like a lot of people do when they talk about epistemic logic, um, you know, and just do some interesting comparisons. So what are the three interpretations? And this should be kind of familiar, I guess, from those of you who are into these things in the uh, modal setting. Um, so one interpretation is to understand sufficiency here in terms of what you might call knowledge per se. 
Okay, so in that case, what we would be after in our logic is a is the logic of what we would say called knowledge per se. In other words, just the logic of knowledge attributions, and that's it, without any kind of restrictions or anything like that. In that case, you should read knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi as knowing phi entails knowing psi. Very simple. Okay. On the other hand, here's a second interpretation, and this is probably the most popular interpretation for the, in the Hintekin setting. Uh, we'll call this um, in principle knowability. So the idea here is when you give an epistemic logic, your target is to capture the logic of in principle knowability. The way to read the sufficiency claim in that case is for cognitively ideal agents, knowing phi entails knowing psi. Okay, so we're restricting to cognitively ideal agents, otherwise talking about ordinary options. The third interpretation is in terms of something I'll call strong warrant transmission. So the way to read knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi in this case is that knowing phi provides strong warrant for psi. What do I mean by strong warrant? Strong warrant you should understand as knowledge level propositional justification. Okay, so knowing phi provides strong warrant for psi, that's just a way of saying knowing phi provides knowledge level propositional justification for psi. Um, so as opposed to doxastic justification, as opposed to weaker types of justification that are below what you need for knowledge, that kind of thing. All right. I'm not going to get into the distinctions here between the different types of justification. Uh, if you like, just read strong warrant as justification for sci. But it's good enough for knowledge. Um, what else should I say about this? Uh, yeah, just by the way, something that's worth noting. Um, when we read knowing phi provides strong warrant for psi, you shouldn't read that as knowing phi entails having strong warrant for psi. We really want to capture the idea of the knowing of phi that provides the warrant. Okay, so there's some warrant transmission happening. It's actually the, the knowledge is doing some justificatory work. Okay. All right. So to illustrate the difference between these interpretations, let's look at some examples. So we're still at the level of sort of informal intuition here, right? Um, so look at these examples. First one says, knowing Jane is a lawyer is sufficient for knowing she's a fisherman. Second one says, knowing Jane is an expert lawyer is sufficient for knowing she's a lawyer. Third one says, knowing Jane is a lawyer is sufficient for knowing Cantor's theorem. Finally, knowing the ZF axioms is sufficient for knowing Cantor's theorem. Um, now, the first thing to note about these claims is that all three of our interpretations are going to think that the first claim is false, okay? Um, so if any way of reading sufficiency here, that's going to be a false claim. Yeah. Knowing Jane is a lawyer obviously doesn't entail knowing she's a fisherman, right? It's easy to know she's a lawyer without knowing she's a fisherman. Uh, but that's true also for cognitively ideal agents, surely, right? Um, and it's also true when we're talking about strong warrant tr transmission. So knowing Jane, Jane is a lawyer doesn't provide a good reason to think she's a fisherman. It certainly doesn't give you knowledge level justification for it, right? So on any interpretation, one's going to come out as false. That seems clear enough. On the other hand, um, what interpretation one, in terms of knowledge per se, ordinary knowledge attributions, what that's going to say, I think, intuitively, is that only two comes out as true on that reading, OK? So it does seem true to me to say that um, if you know Jane is an expert lawyer, that's going to entail that you know she's a lawyer, OK? No exceptions. Um, on the other hand, it's going to be false to say, uh, well, let's put it this way, three is going to be false. Why? Because, of course, it's possible for somebody to know Jane is a lawyer without knowing Cantor's theory. What's more, it's possible to know the ZF axioms without knowing Cantor's theory. Okay, so three and four are uh, false in our first interpretation where we're thinking about knowledge per se. As for interpretation two, what that's going to say is that two, three, and four are all true. Okay, so remember, this interpretation two is the one that says we're thinking about cognitively ideal agents. Okay, so two is going to come out as true, but of more interest, look at three and four. For cognitively ideal agents, uh, if uh, such an agent knows the chain is a lawyer, well, that's going to entail that they know Cantor's theorem because Cantor's theorem is a priori and they're cognitively ideal and they know all a priori truths. So uh, uh, if they know Jane's a lawyer, something else they know is that Cantor's theorem holds, right? I mean, assuming Cantor's theorem is a priori. What's more, if uh, for a cognitively ideal agent, um, if such an agent knows the ZF axioms, they're also going to know Cantor's theorem. Presumably on the basis of those axioms. But again, it's because they're cognitively ideal, they know all the a priori truths. Finally, interpretation three, in terms of strong knowledge transmission, uh, strong prop uh, propositional justification transmission, anyway, um, that's only clearly going to say that uh, four is true. 
right? I hope everyone agrees with that. Uh, or on that interpretation, what this is saying is that knowing the ZF axioms provides strong justification for believing Cantor's theorem. And I think that's, that's correct when we're talking about propositional justification. The ZF axioms surely do provide a good reason to believe Cantor's theorem, whether you've come to realize that or not, right? But the justification is sort of there for the taking. Um, on the other hand, um, knowing Jane is a lawyer doesn't provide strong justification for knowing Cantor's theorem. Um, two is a tricky one on the third interpretation, uh, because you might worry that there's a worry about circularity here that takes away the justification. I mean, if you know Jane is an expert lawyer, is that a good reason to think that she's a lawyer? Well, you might think the argument from saying Jane is an expert lawyer to concluding that she's a lawyer, you might worry that's circular, right? It begs the question. So you might think there's no justification transmission. Uh, but we're going to make our lives easier by allowing for what we've called degenerate justification transmission. So we're going to allow for circular justification transmission. We just consider it degenerate. So sort of nothing interesting is going on in those cases, but it simplifies our way of thinking about the logics. We'll leave thinking about non-degenerate transmission of justification for another day. Okay, so I hope the three interpretations are fairly clear. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start working through some principles of interest. Okay, so think of these as candidate principles for capturing logical truths for a correct epistemic logic. And already we see the landscapes a little complicated, right? Because we've got at least three different interpretations to be keeping in mind and we're expecting to see some differences, okay? Um, so what I'm gonna start off with is a list of some uncontroversial principles. And what I mean by saying they're uncontroversial is that I think uh, more or less any epistemic logic should satisfy these principles. That's the claim I'm gonna make, okay? Whether, and it doesn't matter what your target of analysis is, um, uh, you should go for these principles. Another way to think about it, maybe um, a less contentious way to put it is, I think these principles are so simple that if you don't even think your epistemic logic um, uh, observes these kinds of principles, then maybe you shouldn't be in the epistemic logic game at all because there's probably no interesting epistemic logic, okay? All right, so what kind of principles do I have in mind? I'll call the first one simplification. The way to read this is just the usual way. Um, it's valid that this principle holds, right? So you've got a formula and then there's the validity symbol. Um, so simplification says that it's valid that um, knowing P and Q is sufficient for knowing P. And uh, then we've got this variation here. Then we've got reflexivity, which says knowing P is sufficient for knowing P. Then we've got coarser, cautious agglomeration, okay? Um, this says that, okay, suppose that knowing P is sufficient for knowing Q. And in that case, follows that knowing P is sufficient for knowing P and Q, all right? Cautious transitivity, suppose that knowing P is sufficient for knowing Q and knowing P and Q is sufficient for knowing R. Uh, in that case, it follows that knowing P is sufficient for knowing R. And finally, cautious monotonicity, if, uh, suppose if, well, if knowing P is sufficient for knowing Q and knowing P is sufficient for knowing R, follows that knowing P and Q is sufficient for knowing R. Okay, so I claim these are uncontroversial principles. Um, some of them, I hope, just jump out at you as seeming uncontroversial, but um, some of them maybe not so much. So let me just say something to justify a couple of them to sort of give you the flavor for why I think that they're uncontroversial. So let's start off with, and I'll give you a couple of examples to try and that are, seem to be easy to generalize. Um, to try and convince you, at least for two of our uh, interpretations of the logic, that this principle should be accepted. Okay, so first of all, think about the case of knowledge per se. Now, here's what I claim. The following is true, and obviously true to ordinary uh, speakers. Knowing that two is even and prime entails knowing that two is even, okay? It'd be very strange to say of someone that they know that two is even and prime, but deny outrightly that they know two is even. That might even strike you as a contradictory thing to say, all right? So, so much um, I claim for uh, uh, knowledge per se. Um, on the other hand, let's, let's think about uh, the interpretation in terms of strong warrant transmission. So I claim uh, that the following is true. A strongly warranted belief that two is even and prime uh, provides strong warrant for believing two is even. Again, that seems fine, especially if you allow for um, degenerate warrant transmission in case you're worried about circularity or something. Okay, so of course you can say more to try and justify this principle, but uh, this is the kind of flavor of the justification, I think. It's very hard to come up with counterexamples. Um, ordinary expressions, if you violate these principles, it seems like you've got contradictions in your hands, that kind of thing. Let me give you a slightly more com complicated example. Um, cautious agglomeration, all right? 
So I'm going to claim that this principle is true. And basically, on the basis of claiming that this following claim down here is obviously true intuitively, the claim is this. Knowing that Jane is an expert lawyer entails knowing that Jane is both an expert lawyer and a lawyer. Okay, so this is, I'm trying to justify here that this is a good principle to have if you're looking at the logic of knowledge per se, so of ordinary knowledge attributions without restriction, okay? Um, so I hope everyone agrees that what I just said sounds true. Knowing that Jane is an expert lawyer entails knowing that Jane is both an expert lawyer and a lawyer. I mean, that sounds right. I mean, if somebody knows that she's an expert lawyer, surely she'll know she's an expert lawyer and a lawyer. I mean, it just seems like a redundant, needlessly complicated way of saying, restating what they know, right? Now, notice that this gives us some intuitive support for this kind of principle, right? So we accept that knowing that Jane is an expert lawyer entails knowing she's a lawyer. And that seems to give us a good reason for saying that if you know she's an expert lawyer, well, it's going to follow that you know that she's both an expert lawyer and a lawyer, okay? Because there's a sort of redundancy built into it. And you can come up with lots of examples like this to convince yourself this is a good principle. Okay. Um, all right. So, of course, way more can be said to uh, convince one that those are uncontroversial principles. And again, if you're not convinced by any of that, again, I think maybe a good way to think about it is if you don't like any such principle, then you should get out of the epistemic logic game because you're probably not going to accept any epistemic logic. So I like those as sort of a list of uncontroversial principles that still keep the logic interesting and have at least some justification behind them. I'm not claiming every philosopher would accept them. No, you know, there's no, there's no claim that every philosopher accepts. All right, next, uh, let's move to what I'm going to call a list of relatively uncontroversial principles. And these ones are interesting, I think, because um, at least on some of the interpretations, it's very clear what to say about them. So for each of these principles, uh, if you fix a certain interpretation for the logic, um, it's going to be clear that you should either clearly reject this principle or clearly hold on to it. So for each of those principles, we'll be able to say that. As for the other interpretations, it's going to turn out that the picture is a little murky. And the way I sort of think about that is, well, that means that you can leave it up to your logic to decide what to say about these principles, because it's not really clear intuitively what to think about them. So you sort of leave it to your system to tell you what to think about them. Right? All right, so let me go through some examples here. Uh, so here's an example, double negation. This says it's valid. Uh, the following is valid. Knowing P entails knowing not not P, all right? Now, why is that relatively uncontroversial? Well, if you're thinking about the knowledge of cognitively ideal agents, I claim that this looks like a clearly correct principle. I mean, maybe given some background assumptions that I accept um, about the way logic works and so on. But uh, you know, if it's certainly true that P entails not not P, and you've got a cognitively ideal agent, and they know P, surely they also know not not P, right? So there's at least one interpretation where this seems to be a clearly correct principle. On the other hand, it's a very murky principle if you're thinking about uh, knowledge attribution, knowledge uh, ordinary knowledge attribution, knowledge per se. If somebody knows P, does it follow that they know not not P? Well, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, is that just a simple inference? Or is it really part of what they know? Not sure. Here's another example, weak simplification. This says knowing P and Q entails, uh, is sufficient rather for knowing uh, P or Q. Here's another one. Um, this says it's valid. The following is valid. Knowing P is sufficient for knowing either P or not P. Okay, here's another example. This one's particularly interesting, by the way, a priori. Um, this says suppose that P is a priori. Conclusion, P is knowable relative to any uh, background knowledge, okay? So for any psi whatsoever, knowing psi entail, uh, is sufficient for knowing P. Right. This is an interesting principle in particular. This is an example of a principle that divides, um, acts as a dividing line between some of the interpretations and what kind of logic you want for them. So clearly this is gonna be a false principle for the logic of knowledge per se, right? We're just talking about knowledge in general. Clearly there are gonna be some a priori truths that um, some of us don't know. Okay, so this principle should have counterexamples. On the other hand, if you're thinking about cognitively ideal agents, the way people usually think about them anyway, uh, this seems to be clearly a correct principle. If something's a priori and we're talking about a cognitively ideal agent, by definition, the kind of agent that knows all the a priori truths, it's gonna follow um, that they know P, no matter what background knowledge they have. Okay, it's gonna be part of what they know. All right, um, here's another principle, transitivity. Uh, knowing P 
if knowing P is sufficient for knowing Q and knowing Q is sufficient for knowing R, it's going to follow that knowing P is sufficient for knowing R. Okay. And here's the last one. Um, if knowing P is sufficient for knowing R, it follows that knowing P and Q is sufficient for knowing R. Okay. Uh, now I don't have time to go through all of these and try and convince you uh, that they are relatively uncontroversial. Uh, let me just say something about a couple more of them to, again, give you kind of the flavor of what we have in mind here. So look at this principle here, weak omniscience, knowing P is sufficient for knowing P or not P. This is a murky principle, again, for um, the logic of knowledge per se, so ordinary knowledge attribution. So I phrase it here as a question. Does knowing that Jane is a lawyer entail knowing that she's either a lawyer or she isn't? Well, I'm not sure what to say. I mean, um, you know, it, it seems to hinge on whether you think that's a simple inference, but one that an agent might fail to make, or whether you think that uh, knowing that she's either a lawyer or she isn't is part of knowing that she's a lawyer. But I'm not really sure what to say about that, right? On the other hand, uh, think about cognitively ideal agents again. Uh, in this case, uh, it seems clear that you'd want to say this, knowing Jane is a lawyer entails knowing that she's a lawyer or she isn't, right? A cognitively ideal agent if it's a matter of inference, would be able to make that inference. Okay, so it seems like a fine principle in that case. Um, I said something already about the a priority principle, but maybe just to emphasize this because it's gonna be important for us later. So um, in terms of knowledge per se, clearly some ordinary agents don't know that there are infinite primes despite this being a priori, right? So here's a counter example. On the other hand, for a cognitively ideal agent, knowing that Jane is a lawyer entails knowing that there are infinite primes since the letter is a priori. And of course we could uh, replace their existing infinite primes with any a priori truth we like. So it looks like a general principle in that case. Um, all right, now here's another example of a relatively uncontroversial principle, the principle of transitivity. Um, I don't wanna to say too much about this one uh, so I don't wanna to spend too long on the principles. Um, I just wanna point out that this one's interesting because um, some people think they're counter examples to this when we're thinking about strong justification. So for instance, Martin Smith has, um, um, has given what he thinks is a counterexample to this principle when we're thinking about the transmission of strong propositional justification. On the other hand, this is a principle that's clearly true when we're thinking about the logic of knowledge per se or the logic of knowledge for cognitively ideal agents. Um, it's just gonna follow in that case from the fact that we accept that entailment is transitive. So, I mean, I suppose if you give up the idea that entailment is transitive, you might not accept this principle in that case, but I'm happy to be orthodox here. So again, this looks relatively uncontroversial. The two of our interpretations looks clearly correct. For the third one, it's kind of murky. Some people say there are counterexamples, which we could go through, um, but let's not get too caught up in that. All right. Um, now, almost there. I just wanna give four more principles. And in some ways, these are the most interesting because these are the controversial ones. And what makes these ones controversial is that they are principles that um, they are, there are philosophical paradoxes out there that some people think count as giving us counter examples to these principles. And the paradoxes seem to be very flexible in the sense that they, it looks like you can tweak them so that you end up with a counter example for um, our epistemic logic on any of the interpretations we're interested in. Okay, whether we're talking about knowledge per se, or talking about uh, propositional justification, or talking about the uh, knowledge of cognitively ideal agents. It looks like you could take these paradoxes and generate yourself a potential counterexample. Okay, of course, I'm not going to say that it's clear that these paradoxes work. That's a matter of great contention. Um, but some people take them seriously as generating counterexamples. And for others, uh, you might think the lesson here is that we should be careful not to have a logic that commits to these kinds of principles because we should try and be neutral on such controversial principles. Okay. All right. So what kind of what principles am I talking about here? Let me start off with this one, negative addition. This says the following. If knowing phi is sufficient for knowing P, it follows that knowing phi is sufficient for knowing that it's not the case, that it's not the P and Q. Okay. Here's another example, a glossion. Um, we can actually leave off, off talk here of phi because phi can be anything. So let's read it as follows. If you know that P, if you know that Q, then uh, it follows that you know P and Q. That's basically what this is saying. Or look at single premise closure over here. This says the following. 
if you're in a position in OP and Q is an a priori implication of P, it's gonna follow that you're in a position to know Q, okay? And finally, disjunctive syllogism, okay? This says, if you're in a position to know not P and you're in a position to know P or Q, it's gonna follow that you're in a position to know Q, all right? So one thing, of course, that's interesting about these principles, when you take a look at them first, sort of at first sight, they look like very tempting principles, at least when we're talking about cognitively ideal agents, um, certainly when we're talking about justification transmission, but some people even think they look pretty good for ordinary knowledge attribution. So it's kind of interesting that we can use philosophical considerations to come up with counterexamples today. So let me say something very brief. And as most of you know, there's a lot to say about these paradoxes. So I'm gonna to have to be very brief, but to give you a flavor in case uh, somehow you haven't seen all these paradoxes before, um, let me give you a sense of them. So let's start off with agglomeration, okay? And what kind of uh, paradox are we interested in here? Well, preface paradoxes, right? So the preface counterexample uh, due to Mackinson. So let me give you uh, a sense of how that would work. So the idea is it's an example along these lines. Suppose we've got an agent that knows P1 through PN. She wrote it down in a book, did a lot of research, right? Um, historian writing down some well-researched historical claims, something like that. What's more, the agent knows the books of this length frequently contain an error. So the conclusion is that means she's not positioned to know the conjunction of all the claims in the book, all right? If she knows books of this length frequently contain an error, then she knows there exists an error somewhere in the book. Okay, but that's incompatible with her knowing that all the claims are true at once. So she's not positioned to know uh, the conjunction of all the claims in the book, despite knowing each individual claim. And again, you can take this kind of example and rephrase it in terms very clearly in terms of ordinary knowledge attribution. You can rephrase it in terms of cognitively ideal agents, if you like. You can rephrase it in terms of propositional justification. Um, Any way you, you slice it, it looks like you can come up with a candidate counterexample to the principle. All right, let me give you another example. I can do two at once in this case, the principle of negative addition and the principle of single premise closure. People claim there are some counterexamples to these. Um, in particular, uh, you can give Cartesian counterexamples of the following form. I'll do it in terms of a cognitively ideal agent um, in this case. So suppose we've got a cognitively, cognitively ideal agent X. She knows she has hands. Now, not being a handless brain and bat is an a priori implication of having hands, all right? So it follows that X doesn't know she isn't a, well, but here's something else that's true. X doesn't know that she isn't a handless brain in the back. Okay, all right, so we've got the premises here. In particular, if you look at single premise closure, we've got two claims that seem to be the right form to be the premises here. Um, but the final claim here is of this form and it's false intuitively. But it's very easy to take this, rephrase it as a um, counterexample also to negative addition. I won't get into the details. Some of you probably see it straight away. Um, okay, and yeah, let me skip over a couple of things because I'm probably taking a bit too long on some of these things. So you can come up with other counterexamples from the literature to these both of these claims at once. For instance, the dogmatism counterexample from Harmon and Kripke can be used here in case you don't like the Cartesian one. Um, and let me just say something quickly about disjunctive syllogism. Where does the counterexample to this claim, uh, to this principle come from? Well, you can uh, appeal to the surprise exam um, uh, story, right, to generate a counterexample here. So how would that go? So suppose you get a teacher, again, this is familiar to a lot of you, I'm sure, but suppose you get a teacher announces a surprise exam is coming the following week, okay? The students know that either the Friday, uh, either it's gonna be a Friday exam, that's P, or it's gonna be earlier, that's Q. But if it happened on a Friday, that would mean there's no surprise because by the time you get to Thursday night, you can see the exam coming, right? So it wouldn't be a surprise after all. So they conclude, well, it can't happen on Friday, right? Not P. But it cannot be that they come to know Q this way because if they could, they could just keep iterating the reasoning and come to a paradoxical conclusion that in fact, surprise exams are impossible. Okay, so one way to understand this, not the only way, but one way to understand what's going on here is we have a counterexample to this principle. You can no, not P, you can know P or Q, and yet not be in a position to know Q. All right. But once again, uh, this is all very contentious. There are different ways of understanding these uh, paradoxes, but that's not the point. The point is this. Uh, certainly one prominent way of understanding these paradoxes is as counterexamples to these principles. And again, you might think it's desirable to have a logic that doesn't take a strong stance in a perplexing philosophical debate. 
So that's why you don't want to validate these principles. Um, maybe it's because you don't accept the counterexample, but it might be that you want your logic to be neutral. You might think that's a virtue of your logic. All right, good. That, so that was a whole lot of principles for us to think about. Um, but the important thing about them is they give us a way of testing a logic, right? So we've got some uncontroversial principles that are a target. We want them to be validated. We've got some relatively controversial principles that look like we want slightly different results depending on the interpretation we're interested in. And then we've got some sort of straightforwardly controversial principles that you might think we don't want to validate them because we're miring ourselves in controversy on any interpretation. All right, good. So that's sort of one way of trying to test a logic. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn to the Hintzkin semantics. I'm going to present, it's going to be more or less standard, so I'll do it quickly. On the other hand, I'm going to give it kind of a twist because I'm talking about conditional knowledge operators as opposed to uh, unary knowledge operators, which is more common in this area. Um, so I just want to emphasize that, that twist a little bit, but otherwise I'm just going to say something very quick and well known about uh, this way of approaching things. Okay, so if you try and give a um, standard Hintikan semantics for our language, this is what it's going to look like. You're going to give something called a Hintikan model to interpret the language. What is a Hintikan model as we understand it? It's going to be a model M that looks like this. It's got two components, W and little v. What is W? It's a non-empty set of possible worlds. And what is V? It is a uh, function that assigns a subset of the worlds to each atom in the language. Okay. And this is a model again in the uh, sort of standard logical sense of being sort of enough to uh, then interpret every sentence in the language. Okay. All right. So what's going on here? Um, uh, well, one thing that's worth emphasizing, we'll think of the possible worlds here as being empirical possibilities. So we're giving them sort of an epistemic flavor, the sense of possibility here uh, at stake. I think that when we're doing epistemic logic, it's good to give a sort of epistemic reading. So we think of them as empirical possibilities. That means these are possibilities that can only be ruled out given some empirical information, all right? And when we think about V assigning a subset of the worlds to an atom, the way to think about that is that the subsets of W are propositions on this model, okay? They are claims, abstract claims about the way the world is. So a good way, I think, for our purposes to think about what this kind of model is doing is not just to think of it as a model in the logical sense of giving us an interpretation of language, but also think of it as a model of epistemic space. Basically, what it's doing is it's telling us, uh, it's giving us a model of all the different possible bodies of knowledge that an agent can have. Basically, in this case, it's going to be all the propositions, so all these subsets of W. And the way we're thinking about those bodies of knowledge is um, think of them this way, if you've got a subset of W, it's got some worlds in there, think of those as the worlds that haven't been ruled out by the empirical information that the agent has. Okay, so you've got some agent in the background, they've got some empirical information. Um, the set of worlds there, the body of knowledge the agent has is the set of worlds that's not ruled out by the empirical information at the agent's disposal. Okay, so that's how we're going to model a body of knowledge in this case. All right, so with that in mind, here comes the semantics. Um, so first I'm going to give you a sort of very standard semantics, truth of a world for all the propositional formulas. Um, when is P true, just in case the valuation tells you. When is not phi true, just in case phi is not true. When is the conjunction true, just in case each conjunct is true. Okay, very standard. Of more interest for us, I'm going to give you um, truth con uh, satisfaction conditions for the epistemic formulas. And the way I'm going to do it, which is a little non-standard, they're going to be in terms of the model. So we're going to talk about satisfaction of truth at the whole model, not just at a particular world. And the reason for that is because um, the truth for each of these formulas is going to be quantifying over all of the worlds. So there's sort of no point in talking about an individual world here. These are formulas that come out rel true relative to the whole model. So you should think relative to our entire model of epistemic space. Okay, so uh, to give you a sense of how this works, Look at a phi. So it's a priori that phi. On this model, when does, um, uh, on this way of thinking about epistemic space, when does something like this come out as true relative to a background Hintika model? Well, just in case phi is true at all of the worlds. Okay, so phi is a priori, just in case it's true at all the worlds in the model. So in other words, uh, phi is the kind of formula that doesn't have alternatives that are empirical alternatives. That's why it's a priori. There are no worlds where not phi is true. There are no empirical possibilities where not phi comes out as true. That's why this is a natural account here of a priority on this model. 
On the other hand, uh, when does the arrow formula come out as true? Remember, this says that uh, phi uh, has as an a priori implication psi. When does that come out as true? Well, we're going to have a strict implication account here. Um, basically, it's going to be true relative to the model, just in case every phi world is also a psi world. So in other words, um, if you ruled out all of the not phi worlds, you only end up with phi worlds, with psi worlds, sorry. Okay. And finally, what about um, conditional knowledge claims in this case? Uh, what we're going to have here is that uh, phi, knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi, just in case every phi world is again a psi world. All right. So one thing that's interesting about that is that these two clauses are exactly the same on standard hint way of doing things, basically, a priori implication and conditional knowability, they come to the same thing, okay? It's just two different notations talking about the same thing, okay? All right, so again, this is done in terms of conditional knowability, uh, conditional knowledge operators. It's a little different to the standard way of doing these things, but um, the idea is, the basic idea is that just the stock standard ones from um, the classic Hintika semantics. The basic idea is a body of knowledge of possible worlds, you know something, if it's true at all of the worlds in your set of accessible worlds, the set of worlds that aren't ruled out by your empirical information. So if that's how you're thinking about knowledge and the truth of a knowledge claim, then conditional knowability should just be understood in terms of set containment, right? So in other words, strict implication like we've got here. All right, so with that on the table, we can define the usual notions of uh, implication, logical implication and validity. I won't go into the details because the important point is this, on the Hintikin approach, what we end up with is that every one of our aforementioned principles in, on our long list turned out to be validated. So that's fine because some of them were uncontroversial. So that's a good thing. That's a, that's a matter of success for the Hintikin approach, but a whole lot of controversial principles were validated too. And in some cases, on some interpretations, the logic is just clearly wrong. Okay, so for instance, one principle that gets validated is a priority, which says that everything that's a priori is already known. So what that tells us is that this is a useless uh, logic for trying to capture ordinary knowledge attribution, right? The logic of ordinary knowledge attribution. It's fine for uh, cognitively ideal agents, which is the usual interpretation, but you're not getting very far in terms of trying to model ordinary knowledge um, and its logic with um, this way of doing things. Okay, so those, that's supposed to be a downside to this kind of um, semantics and this kind of approach. All right, so now in the little time I have left, I'm gonna keep talking, I hope for about another 10 minutes. Um, hope that's okay. We kind of started about 10 minutes late. So we still good? All right, so hopefully in about 10 minutes now, what I'm gonna be able to do is introduce the truth maker approach and show you that there are at least six different ways to go here. And then just say something very quickly uh, about how the logics here work out. Okay, so this is the part where I'm hoping everyone's seen truth maker semantics at some point before. Uh, if you haven't, I hope you at least get a flavor. Okay, so I'm going to start off by just telling you about um, Fine's truth maker semantics the basics and then try and give you the extension. So the uh, things I'm going to say over the next couple of slides are just uh, sort of stock standard stuff for Fine and truth maker semantics. All right, so I'm going to start off telling you what a state space is. What's a state space? It's a tuple S with a partial order. Okay, and the S is a set, um, it's a non-empty set, and we're calling it the set of states, all right? So that mathematically, that's what these things are. Intuitively, here's how you're supposed to think about a state space, especially in contrast to a space of worlds like uh, we saw in Hinton. Um, the state space, uh, the set S, you're thinking of them as states. What are states? Think of them as situations, all right? So as opposed to thinking of them as worlds, so sort of total realities, uh, think of them as situations, which intuitively you can think of as being a part of a total reality. Okay, so an easy way to sort of get a grip on these things initially is think of the states as parts of worlds, in particular their situations. There's something like collections of objects standing in relations to each other. Okay, as for the partial order on the state space, think of that as the parthood relation on the state space. So it's a parthood relation on the situations. Now, intuitively, situations do have a parthood relation. It makes sense to say one situation is part of another. So, uh, you know, I've got, you can think of the situation of Aristotle pontificating with Plato nearby in his toga, something like that. That situation has different parts. In one part, we've got the part that just involves Aristotle. So it's Aristotle by himself pontificating in a situation, leaving out the part about Plato, for instance. Right? 
So intuitively, situations have parts. That's what we're trying to capture with the parthood relation here. Okay, so intuitively states of situations, parts of worlds. Um, the less than or equal to sign talks about the parthood relation, the partial order here. Um, another important idea for us here is the idea of fusion between states. So we're gonna assume that we can take states and fuse them together to make bigger states. And we're gonna uh, show that with this kind of notation. Um, so where T is a subset of the states, uh, we're gonna write this to talk about the fusion of all those states. Um, more importantly for us actually, it's just the fusion of two states. So when I write S uh, fusion T, um, understand that as just fusing, intuitively as fusing together those two states to make a bigger state. More technically what it is, is the least upper bound relative to our partial order um, of, those, of those two states. All right, that's a state space. That's not quite what our model of epistemic space is gonna be. In fact, what I've got in front of you now, which is a small enrichment of a state space, this is gonna be our model of epistemic space and of bodies of knowledge and so on. Call this a modalized state space. What is this? It is a tuple composed of a state space with the special feature that it is complete. And basically, all that that means is that we can always fuse states together. It's never the case that you find states that don't have a fusion, all right? And uh, more, perhaps more importantly, um, for now, um, the other thing that's added in here is a set P. What is P? It is a subset of the states. And we're gonna think of it as this um, the subset of possible states, okay? Um, and the formal features it's gonna have is it's gonna be non-empty. So we're assuming there are some possible states and it's gonna be downward closed. And what I mean by that is that if a state's in there, if it counts as possible, then all of its parts are gonna be in there too. Uh, parts of possible states are also possible. All right. And now to ensure that we've got sort of a good grip on interpreting this in an, uh, in an epistemic way, I'm again going to be thinking, following what I said earlier in the Hintikin case, of the possible states as being empirical possibilities. So think of them as possibilities such that if you want to rule them out, you need some empirical information. All right. Now notice we've got some states that aren't possible. On this interpretation, the way to think about those states is those are the ones that you can rule out without empirical information. Okay, they're impossible in that sense, right? It doesn't mean that an agent hasn't ruled them out, it's just that you don't need empirical information to rule them out. All right, a couple of definitions. We'll say that states S and T are compatible when, when you fuse them together, you get something that's possible. We can introduce the idea of a world in this setting. What is a world? It's a maximal state, okay? So uh, basically what that means is that every state that's compatible with such a thing is already part of it. So that's the sense in which we can allow worlds into the picture. What is a proposition in, in this kind of story? Well, a proposition sort of straightforwardly understood is just gonna be a non-empty subset of the states. Um, and we're gonna stipulate that it's closed under fusions. But probably the most important thing for now is the way we're thinking about um, those states is no longer just as uh, states at which um, the proposition is true, like we did before. Now we're gonna think of them as truth makers, okay? States that make the proposition true. Um, and it's worth adding, uh, kind of important, in fact, in this setting, that that's one way of thinking about a proposition, very analogous to the Hintikin approach. But there's another way of thinking about a proposition here where we can think about bilateral propositions, where you think about a proposition as being a pair of propositions that are incompatible. And to say they're incompatible just means that you pick a state from one, pick a state from the other. Um, those states are always incompatible. And why would we care about a bilateral proposition? Well, think about the one set as being the truth maker here's to the proposition and the other one as the false make proposition. Okay, so um, that is our model of epistemic space in this case. Now we just need to add one more thing so that we can interpret our language. And this is what we can call a model in the logical sense now. A model in a logical sense is a modalized state space with evaluation. What does the evaluation do? It assigns a bilateral proposition to each atom in the language, okay? So that's kind of uh, analogous to the Hintikin approach. Now let me give you, um, this is still standard, it's fine stuff. I'm gonna give you some, uh, the definition of what we're gonna call exact verification and exact falsification. So basically what I'm gonna tell you is when a state verifies or makes true a sentence in our language, but I'm gonna be paying attention only to the propositional formulas at this point. I'll get to the epistemic stuff in a second, probably in the next slide, I think. Um, 
And it's important to uh, realize that at this point, we're talking about something called exact truth making or exact verification and falsification. Um, basically, what that means is we're thinking of these states as making a part, let me say a sentence rather, making a sentence true or false, okay, but in an exact sense. So uh, that means that the state doesn't have any irrelevant stuff in it that's got nothing to do with making that sentence true. More things, more can be said about these points. Uh, we need to press on. So let me just give you the semantics. Um, okay, so suppose we're given a model and suppose we're given a state. Now we're going to define the exact verification relation and the exact falsification uh, relation. How does it work? Well, a atom is going to be made true by a state just in case the valuation tells you that that's what it does. Um, similarly, a atom is made false by a state just in case that's what the valuation tells you. So in other words, that state is in the set of false makers for that propositional atom according to the valuation. What does negation do? Well, what negation does is it basically just flips truth making and false making. So when does the negation of phi, when is that made true by a state? Well, just in case that state is a falsifier for phi, okay? And as for conjunction, when does a conjunction, when is that made true exactly by a state? Uh, this is probably the most interesting clause, just in case there exists two other states such that if you fuse them together, the one state, the first one is a uh, exact verifier for the first conjunct and the second state is an exact verifier for the second conjunct, okay? And then there's a falsification condition for conjunctions, but I'm gonna skip over that. All right, um, okay, actually there's one last thing we need to say and I need to hurry up um, before we can get to the, uh, 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 where we get the epistemic stuff and then that's our big send off. All right, so let me just say this last thing. So we just gave some uh, definitions for exact verification and exact falsification for propositional formulas. Um, but let me just say something about what verification and falsification full stop are in this setting. Basically, a state is gonna verify full stop a sentence just in case that state contains an exact verifier. And it's going to falsify a sentence just in case it contains a exact falsifier. That's the definition. All right, good. So now I'm gonna tell you about the um, epistemic formulas relative to this way of setting things up. I'm gonna start off with the a priori sentences, the claims of a priority and the claims of a priori implication, okay? And it's gonna follow what we did with the Hintekin case because I'm gonna talk about these things being true or false relative to the whole model, okay? Relative to our picture of how epistemic space works. Okay, so I'm not giving you uh, truth-making conditions for these things. I'm telling you relative to a certain way of thinking about what bodies of knowledge we have, in, possible bodies of knowledge we have in the table, how they interact with each other. In other words, sets of states in this case. I'm telling you uh, what counts as a a priori claim and what counts as an a priori implication. And here's the story. So A phi, it's a priori that phi comes out as true at a model. Um, just in case, here's the clause. But basically what this says is give me any state that's possible. There's a way of extending it to a state where phi comes out as true, okay? On the other hand, uh, phi has psi as an a priori implication. When does that happen? Just in case for any possible state, if you pay attention to the states, the possible ones where phi comes out as true, then you can always take such a state and extend it to one where psi also comes out as true. Now, why is that a natural way to do things? Well, one way to see it's natural is that it just generalizes what we had in the Hintikin case. Okay, so if you like the Hintikin way of doing things, here it is again, basically. A phi is gonna come out true relative to the model only if for any world that counts as possible, uh, phi is true there, and phi implies psi comes out as true only if for any world in the model, if phi is true, then psi is true there too. Okay. All right. So I think that's all pretty natural. Um, and then we can introduce the idea of implication and validity in the usual way. And we can introduce all these notions of content. We can talk about um, all the states at which the sentence is true. We can talk about the states at which it's exactly true. We can talk about its bilateral content and so on. All right. Uh, gosh, I need to uh, wrap up quite soon. But I'm almost done. So now what I'm gonna to do to finish up is I'm going to give you some candidate accounts according to this way of thinking about things for when a conditional 
knowledge claim comes out as true relative to a model, okay? And uh, here's the sort of big picture here. We can't get into the details right now. But basically the way to think about it is like this. Four of the accounts I'm gonna give you are generalizations, straightforward generalizations of the Hintekin way of doing things, okay? And one reason they're interesting is because they end up giving you different logics. Okay, so that's one reason to separate them out from each other. And the way I like to think about these accounts is basically two of them I'm gonna call ruling in accounts and two of them I'm gonna call ruling out accounts. Now, where does, where does this idea come from? So remember in the Hintekin case, the way we were thinking about things was basically like this. We said that knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi, just in case two things hold and they're actually equivalent to each other. First of all, every world that satisfies phi also satisfies psi, right? So if you restrict attention to the phi worlds, you're left with psi worlds. But there was another way of thinking about it that was equivalent in the Hintekin case, which is a ruling out way of thinking about it. And basically that said that every world that falsifies psi also falsifies phi, all right? So in other words, if you rule out all of the not phi worlds, you're left with, um, you've also ruled out all of the not psi worlds. Okay, that's a ruling out account. So basically what I'm gonna do is give you two ways of generalizing the ruling in account, and then there's sort of a matching ruling out account, and you end up with different logics in the truth maker situation. But then there's at least two other ways that are very natural in the truth maker uh, situation for uh, giving an epistemic logic. And these are what I'm gonna call imminent accounts. Basically what they're gonna say is that knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi, just in case the content of psi is contained in the content of phi. So if, to get this off the ground, you need an account of content parthood, okay? And it turns out that this is one of the things that you find spends a lot of time developing and discussing. So it's very natural to take these ideas and there's at least two different ways of doing it in this setting and just plugging it in and using it as an account of um, uh, conditional knowledge claims in the setting. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to breeze through the actual definitions here. Um, so uh, here's the first ruling in account. When does knowing phi, when uh, is that sufficient for knowing psi? Just in case every possible state that makes phi true is compatible with the state that makes psi true. Okay. Turns out that's a generalization of the Hintzkin approach, but it's matching ruling out account looks like this. When is knowing phi sufficient for knowing psi? Just in case every possible state that makes psi false is compatible with the state that makes exactly phi false, okay? And that's the technical definition. But that's not the only way to generalize the um, Hintekin uh, ruling in and ruling out approaches. So here's another ruling in approach. Knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi, if and only if every possible truth maker for phi has a part that makes psi true, okay? And it's matching ruling out account looks like this. Knowing phi is sufficient for knowing psi, if and only if every possible false maker for psi has a part that makes phi false. Okay. All right, now this definition is a little complicated, so we don't need to get into the details. Basically, the story here is this is just taking fine's definition of when one content is part of another, and we're just plugging it in here. Okay, so uh, I'm out of time, so unfortunately we can't get into the details. So let me just skip over that. And then I'll just point out that there's a variation of this, which is also kind of interesting. Maybe we can talk about it, but uh, let's see. Okay, so this is the big payoff. What we got here is a big table, okay? And the way to read this is we've listed all of the principles that we started off with. So we start with the uncontroversial ones, then go to the relatively controversial ones, and then end off with the controversial ones. And over here in the columns, we've got each of our semantics, okay? for uh, conditional knowability claims, uh, conditional knowledge claims. And a tick means that account, that semantics validates the principle and across means that it invalidates it. So we end up with a very interesting pattern here. The first thing to notice here is that except for two cases, namely three and four, we end up with different logics in each case. And there's lots of notable things about these logics. First of all, we should take them all seriously because they all of them validate the uncontroversial principles. So they're all serious candidates for an epistemic logic. That's the first thing. But the other thing that's notable here is that unlike the Hintzikan approach, uh, certainly a lot of them, they invalidate some of the principles, okay? And in particular, they invalidate some of the controversial principles. So if you think it's a good thing to invalidate them, these naturally do that. But there's no uniformity here, right? And one thing that's interesting is that the first account we gave looks like the analog of the Hintzikan approach because it actually validates everything. 
Okay, so there's no progress that's being made there, but some of the other accounts do make progress. So for instance, if you didn't like single premise closure, if you were convinced by those counter examples, we've got all sorts of accounts here that invalidate it, okay? How about a priority? Remember, a priority is an important principle because that's a principle that um, separates out the logic of ordinary knowledge attribution from talking about cognitively ideal agents. A Hintigan approach, just like our first semantic set, but we've got some accounts of epistemic logic that um, not invalidate this, okay? So it looks like we've made some progress here. We've got candidates for giving a logic of ordinary knowledge attribution here, okay? Um, so those are some good things. Some bad, bad things here is that it's very unclear which is the right way to go, right? I mean, and I'd be interested if anyone's going to have thoughts about that, right? Um, there's so many ways you can go. There's so much flexibility in the truth maker setting. Um, all of them are natural in some sense or other. You know, they're a generalization of the Hedentican approach, or they're using some or other natural account of content parthood or something like that, or something fine discusses that's developed in a nice way, end up with very different stories. So how do we choose? Is there a way to choose? I'm not sure. Okay, so I should stop there. Um, I hope I haven't gone over time. Um, so thank you very much. I hope uh, I didn't gloss over some of the points too much, but uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for the great talk.